All right. So um, in the meantime, you get the material. I will just give you a few <coughs> words about the, this tutorial and, um, oh, sorry. Um, what, what, what's the idea I have in mind with this tutorial? Uh, so, right. Uh, you should have a list of notebooks here. Uh, the original title of this tutorial was 10 Steps to Keras. So the idea was to introduce the Keras framework uh, into 10-ish step, uh, steps. Uh, and these steps are going to be notebooks. Um, uh, you have a preamble notebook here where you can see all the instructions. Uh, in the back, can you read that? Is it fine for you? No, probably it's a bit tiny. Do you want me to zoom? Better? Good. Uh, so this is the, the, the uh, goal for this tutorial, is to introduce the main features of Keras and to learn how you can actually implement uh, deep networks with, using Keras. Uh, and uh, one thing I, 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 I should definitely want you to learn and to, to, to know is that Keras is, um, at the end of the, of the day, is very easy to use but it is not for, e for easy tasks. You can actually do complicated stuff using Keras. So this is the outline for uh, this tutorial, more or less. Uh, and these are the topics we're going to uh, go through uh, in the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, so multi-layer fully connected networks, so to introduce the very basic uh, features. And then we go through uh, hidden layers, features, embeddings, convolution networks, hyperparameter tuning, uh, how you implement custom layers in Keras, and uh, how you actually use uh, deep neural networks, in particular convolution networks and residual networks, uh, transfer learning and fine tuning, uh, and if we have time, uh, recurrent neural network and autoencoders, and in the end, multimodal networks. So I, I tried, there's a lot of stuff as you can see. Um, all the materials is online, you can actually play with it. Uh, all the code has been thought. Uh, to, to, to be uh, run on your notebooks. So I actually simplified some uh, data examples, right? So uh, you should be able to run it in, even if you don't have GPUs in your machines. Uh, but of course, if you have it, it's definitely better. Uh, just run faster. Um, and so I, I'll try to go fast on some topics. So, but in, in any, uh, at any time, if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me. There's no problem at all. All right. Uh, you will find the requirements. Um, basically, it's going to be Python 3. Uh, 3.5, 3.4 should work as well. And also Python 2, but I don't really know. Uh, just a quick note about setting everything up. Um, um, a friend of yours, uh, some people from the audience, uh, send me that actually uh, it, it may be a bit cumbersome to set up the, the Keras uh, folder on Windows machine, uh, if you try to Google it, so uh, what I was uh, saying here, that the .keras folder, where the actual keras configuration file should stay, uh, even on Windows machines, uh, should be placed in your home folder, and so Google it very few minutes ago, it ended up to be that the home folder is what it, you get in return from the uh, this Python function here, right? So typically something like C uh, semicolon double backslash users double backslash and your username, all right? So this is the place where you should create your .keras folder, all right? I know if you experience it, the same problem, but this should uh, fix the problem. So when I say dot, um, uh, home folder here, I assume even on Windows machine that that is the folder. Uh, and so you should have for this notebook, uh, for these series, this tutorial, for this series of notebooks, uh, these configurations files. Uh, I will tell you later on uh, the meanings of these configurations, but they're quite straightforward. So I, I assume you, you already tried and uh, verified everything. That's nice. Good shot. Uh, after that, so let's start with the first notebook, if you don't mind, um, which is going to be number one, multi-layer fully connected network. Uh, the main goal of this, no of this notebook is to 
uh, provide you um, an example on how you can actually deal with uh, Keras and how you can build networks using Keras. Uh, so I, I freely borrow this uh, payoff um, uh, sentence uh, saying that Keras is from the Django project, saying that the Keras is a deep learning library for perfectionists with deadlines. And this means that, um, as in Django does, uh, dealing with Keras um, uh, objects uh, and creating net, uh, networks with Keras is very easy to go. And uh, in fact, one of the main important features of Keras uh, is uh, summarized in these um, um, sentences from, sorry, it's a bit tiny, uh, from, the, from the official documentation when, when uh, they say that being able to go from one idea to results with the least possible delay is the key to doing good research. Um, in a few words, Keras is a high level, in case you don't know, Keras is a high level neural networks API uh, written in Python. It's pure Python, so you can actually take a look at the code and even modify it, um, and, which is capable of running on top of different uh, deep learning frameworks, uh, which Keras calls uh, backends. Uh, so far, the officially supported backends are TensorFlow, C and TK, which is the deep learning library from Microsoft, and this has been the latest addition. Uh, I think it's been uh, added from three or four versions. And Theano, so uh, historically, Keras support, uh, supported Theano and TensorFlow, now CNTK, and um, uh, just for you to know, there's a sort of an official support of MXNet as well in the back end. Uh, it is, I'm saying it's unofficial, well, it's, in, in, it's not in the master branch of the Keras uh, code. Uh, that's because, uh, for some reason, the developer of the MXNet backend supported, uh, are now supporting the Keras 1 uh, uh, API, but now we're using Keras 2 API. So there's been an API change some time ago. Uh, and for some reason, MXNet is still stuck at the Keras 1 API. So that's why the, the MXNet is not yet officially supported. But you can actually, uh, if you use um, Keras 1 uh, version API, you can actually also have MXNet as a backend. Uh, having multiple backends uh, is a feature that you will um, uh, appreciate very soon in the next examples. So. Uh, starting with this very simple example, um, it, it, it's some, um, let me remove just to get some space. Um, it's a Kaggle challenge data. Uh, I just read the, very briefly the problem. Uh, so the Hotter Group is one of the world's biggest e-commerce company. Um, and the consistent analysis of the performance of product is crucial in this company. However, due to diverse global infrastructure, many identical products get classified differently. From this competition, we have provided a data set with 93 features for more than 200,000 products. Of course, for the sake of these projects, I reduced drastically the number of samples. Um, in our data, each row corresponds to a single product, and so we have a total of 93 numerical features, which represents the count of different events. All right. So if you take a look, the data, it should be placed in your data Kaggle auto group folder. Uh, for, for the rest of these examples, we're going to play a bit with a very simple model, which is a logistic regression. Uh, so the, the very, um, for, the, for those of you who doesn't know, the logistic regression uh, is a very supervi simple supervised learning algorithm um, characterized by the usage of the logistic function, also known as sigmoid function which has the shape, so the S shape, that's the sigmoid name. Uh, so after preparing the data and getting the data, so uh, in few words, what we do here is just loading the data from the CSV file. There's actually some pandas code running uh, in the back end. And then we pre-process the data so that we just scale the features uh, uh, using st standard scalar in scikit-learn. And then we pre-process the labels so to have one hot encoding of the labels. Uh, are these terms clear to everybody? So I can go safely with that? Okay, fine, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, taking a look at the final results we have, we have nine classes and 93 features as the, the, uh, we expected. So these are the labels. Of course, these are 
anonymized in some way because they're Kaggle data. And uh, just to give you an example of what is the result of a one-hot encoding, this is something like we just have for each sample one just one element corresponding to uh, the activated bit, the so-called hot bit, and that's why this sort of encoding of the labels is called one-hot encoding because just one single label is um, enabled. Of course, this is a, a single class problem; it's not multi-class. So it, uh, every single sample is just one class in our data. So if you want to implement it in pure Theano code, I, I will go very fast about that. But if you if you want to implement uh, a logistic um, uh, uh, function uh, using Theano, um, these are the code you have to do. So you basically have to declare uh, these objects, so the Theano matrix and uh, the shared uh, variables here. The shared are those that are actually modified during the training. That's the difference. Uh, so you have to implement manually everything, basically. So it's just the uh, probability target, the cross entropy loss function we want to use. And uh, but uh, the only thing, which is not only, of course, but uh, one uh, s something which is uh, provided from Theano is the calculation of the gradient. So Theano provides out of the box a calculation of the gradient. This is one reason why you don't want to really implement uh, this code in pure Python code. So you want to realize, uh, rely on these libraries. So finally, you have to create this Theano function. So that connects uh, every single tensor object you're actually creating. So you provide the input, you provide the output then. Uh, and the, uh, this is the rule for the updates of the shared variables here. So, of course, these are the weights and the bias. Simple model here. So we compile, we, we compile all the code. Um, in case you don't know, this is based on symbolic execution. So you have to compile it and then you run it. Uh, so, so everything you set up previously has not been executed yet until you compile it and you run it. Uh, then you create a new function for the prediction. S uh, using all the tensors already uh, provided. So this is for the training, this is for the prediction, and the rest of the code is just uh, repeating the training process for the number of epochs. So we're actually implementing the, the uh, training process manually. And this is the way Theano does uh, this very simple problem. Uh, as, you, as you can see, it's very low level, right? So you have to implement it at every each step. Uh, if you want to use TensorFlow, uh, as you will um, uh, immediately understand, uh, the, the, the level of, obstru of obstruction is, ex is exactly the same as the Anno. So again, you have to specify a uh, placeholder here. So let me just execute it because I just want to show you something. Um, so you have to um, create the placeholder here. Again, the placeholder are going to be the uh, variables that are going to to be updated during the learning into the graph. Um, so um, as I told you, this is symbolic execution. So if you print X, you just got a tensor object uh, with no shape yet because you don't really have passed the data, fed the data to the graph. And the only thing you know is that you have 93 dimensions, so 93 features. And Y should, will be a tensor having a total number of classes as dimension. That's a second dimension. Um, TensorFlow ships with this um, tool, which is very useful, which is called TensorBoard. Uh, I'm going to execute it just because I want to show you. This is very uh, nice. Uh, so uh, this is a sort of um, a little bit of engineering of the of the TensorFlow code. So we're going to again create all the variables here. Uh, then uh, TensorFlow provides a little bit more abstraction uh, with, um, with respect to Theano. Having uh, this uh, softmax function already implemented, then the matmul uh, operation is going to be the equivalent of the dot operation in NumPy, if you, if you come from that backend, uh, for background. Uh, and then we are actually adding some additional information that will be used in the uh, this TensorBoard tool. So we're going to uh, record some histograms during the learning and some uh, reference to these color objects we have here. Uh, again, so and the, this is very intuitive because we're actually defining different scopes. Uh, so we are defining the scope of the model here, the scope of the cost function, and the scope of the training process. And so they're going to live in different scopes so you can actually better manage them. 
Uh, and finally, the accuracy scope, which is going to be the metric uh, scope we want to use to evaluate our model. Right. So then, uh, TensorFlow provides you this file writer, which is actually something that stores the results of the graph you have. So the computational graph you have in the back end. Uh, and after that, you just run it, defining a TensorFlow session. So everything uh, living in this TensorFlow session can be um, interpreted and then run during the learning process. But again, what you have to do is to implement manually all the um, learning process uh, by actually writing code and providing the uh, the data for each of the tensor you want to change during the learning process. So, oops, that's something went wrong, of course. That's the demo approach. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, let me just, sorry, let me just. Oh. I just want to clear the memory of the GPU. But I'm actually running on some GPUs in a remote backend. So let me run again. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So I have to load the data. All right, come on. It's a cold start, very cold one. All right, so let me skip the then the other part. So let's go to the TensorFlow. All right, okay. Now this is going to work, hopefully. Mm hmm please. All right, so the epochs, we have just run it for 25 epochs, I think. The number of epochs uh, is, um, I can't remember. So we have 25 epochs, and this is the value of the accuracy du during the different epochs, and this is how the, the plot, uh, we have just added it, uh, how we, uh, we plot different uh, cost, how the cost changes during the different epochs. So this is the trend. All right, so uh, I just want to show you this TensorBoard uh, tool, which is going to be something we're going to see also integrated in Keras. That's why I'm showing it now. So I'm I'm running. Uh, so this TensorFlow uh, dot TensorBoard command runs a server, typically on the port uh, six o uh, six double o six. Okay. And what this does is to read the log file that has been written during the execution, in particular, the file uh, stored in this directory. All right. So hopefully we're going to see something. Right. Okay, so we, we have these colors here. So we have the plots for the accuracy automatically provided, the plots for the cost function during the training, and the plots and the, all the different plots for the mean weights and the mean bias. All right, this is very e easy to use and very useful when you, when you, when you face real problems. Another thing it may be useful is to take a look at the graph. So this is actually the model that has been implemented inside TensorFlow. Uh, so this is how the, 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 the graph of tensors has been translated in, by TensorFlow. So you can actually take a look at all the different nodes here. So, and, and each of these corresponds to the different scopes we specified. And finally, these histograms we built to show the difference of the, the, the different trends of the uh, cost histogram and of the model histogram. Uh, there's something wrong maybe because, because I, I just run it multiple times on the save folder, so that's why you see this uh, so strange. But anyway, um, all right, so let me stop this. All right. Okay. 
So let's see how we implement a logistic regression using Keras, finally. Uh, as, you, as you know, the logistic regression may be implemented as a neural network, just one layer, which has the sigmoid activation function. And so here it is. So you have all the data again, and uh, we are going to use the sequential object. We're introducing this new sequential object in Keras. Uh, the sequential object gives you the uh, idea that you want to build a, a series of layers stacked one on top of the other. And so you, you actually instantiate this sequential object and you simply add layers to, to these objects. So, so in this case, we had just had a dense layer having uh, a number of units in output corresponding to the number of classes. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, we specify the input shape, so the number of features we have. And the activation is going to be the sigmoid function, as we expect, because we implemented our logistic regression. Uh, finally, we add the decision function, which is the softmax function, as we did in TensorFlow. And we, in the end, compile the model again. So um, we compile specifying which is the optimizer. In this case, we specify this stochastic rate descent. We actually did the same using TensorFlow. Let me just go back a bit. So when we are in the... Um, in the train scope here, we specify that the optimizer was the gray descent optimizer with, with the minimization problem. So it's a, a stochastic gray descent with this learning rate. And we are doing the same here. So we are implementing the same uh, using the categorical cross entropy and the stochastic gray descent opti also optimizer. After that, we just call this um, method in Keras object, which is called fit. And we provide the data, the training data, and the training labels. And that's it. So you don't have to implement it manually. You don't have to implement the training process manually. You just call the fit method, as you do in scikit-learn, for instance. And that's it. And Keras provides you automatically a series of our default parameters. We're going to change during the next steps of this exercise. but. In the very beginning, you just create the model, you compile it, and you fit it. These are the three steps you have to do, the only three steps you have to do to make a Keras model up and running. And so as you can see, if you run the fit method, uh, you're going to have a, a series of 10 epochs by default. And uh, Keras provides you this progress bar during the training, telling you the, 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 the time it takes, the, the, the values of the loss during the training, and how does it change. All right, this is, very, this is the, the very beginning. Uh, so now let's have a look at, uh, at it in a more um, uh, interesting way, let's say, so in more details. So the core destruction carries is a model, of course, and the main type of model is going to be a sequential object. Uh, the sequential object provides you this method, which is called add, and so you have different layers. In this example, we just had one layer, which is the dense layer, and then the activation layer. Uh, so the dense layer, this is the dense object, okay, has this parameter. Uh, most of them are default values, and in case you don't know, keep the default values. Uh, Keras um, typically has been designed to have the best default values you can get for the different objects. Uh, and this is particularly useful uh, when, when you run it for the first time, especially for optimizers, when you have to set up the learning rate and, uh, depending on the optimizer, different other parameters. Uh, the, 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 the most important things you have to learn and to understand very soon is that the first and the only required parameter for this layer, and this is typically uh, for all the layers, is the first one, which is units. As you can see, it's the only one that has not uh, default values, of course. And this is where you, you put your uh, insight and your knowledge. And the units value is going to be an integer value greater than zero, of course. And this corresponds to the number of, of neurons that you will get in output from the layer. Keep this in mind. It's going to be the output number of neurons, not the input, right? Uh, you, you, you have to specify the number of input uh, dimension only in the first layer. The next layers will, will get the, uh, as input the output of the previous layers. Automatically, you don't have to specify it. So the units is going to be the number of neurons you want in the output. So back to the example. 
since we just have one layer in this uh, example, the number of units we want to have in this network is going to be number of classes because it's the output we want to predict. It's just one layer, right? So it's just number of classes. So in this case, is going to be nine. All right. And as you can actually see, uh, since uh, this is the very first layer of a network, we also specified an input shape. And this is mandatory for the very first layer of the network. You always have to specify what is the input shape. Speaking of which, uh, the input and the output shapes of the layers are going to be this one. So in input shape, you get an n-dimensional tensor object uh, with this series of shape. Remember that the very first dimension of the input uh, tensors are going to be the best size. In other words, the number of samples you're going to provide to the network during the training, right? And this is uh, this parameter is specified when you start the uh, training process, so you call the fit method. You don't have to specify this dimension in the input shape parameter. All right. So let me just go back again to this example. As you can see, the input shape in this case is going to be dims, so the number of features we have. All right. So this is 93 in this case. We don't specify the batch size. The batch size is indeed automatically specified in the feet method. We're going to use the default parameter here, but we're going to, we, we can actually change it. So remember, the, the input shape is mandatory for the very first layer and has to not include, and must not include, sorry, uh, the batch size <coughs> dimension, which is going to be the very first dimension of the tensor you have. And as output, what you get out in output from a tensor is the batch size again, so the same number of samples, of course, but um, as they mentioned, the units you specified as the first parameter of the layer, so the output neurons. All right? Is everything clear? Questions? All right. So, uh, before moving on, uh, some very uh, few notes about the uh, star initializers parameter. So, uh, typically in the dense uh, layer, but in most of the layers, you, you have this kernel underscore initializer and bias initializer parameters. Um, this is just for you to know that uh, in literature, there are lots of methods to initialize the weights of neural networks, uh, and this is particularly useful, and different methods to initialize to, for the initialization of the weights uh, can drastically change the performance you're going to have. Uh, so I just proposed you to take a look, of course, at the keras.initializers to see what are the functions uh, supported by keras, there's lots of them. Uh, and read this very interesting uh, article, uh, this is not um, in, uh, th this article does not uh, include all the possible initializer support by Keras, supported by Keras, but this is very interesting. And I give you some recommendation paper to read. This is a very interesting topic. And as you can see, uh, the uh, default initialization uh, method for different weights, uh, by default, will change um, according to the different layers Keras provides. So if you take a look at the default parameter for the convolutional layer, it, sh it, it should be different. I cannot remember uh, for sure, but it should be different because for convolutional layers, you have different initialization uh, technique by default. Uh, others, core layers provided by Keras, you have flatten layer, reshape layer, permute layer. Uh, these are going to be so-called operational layer. So when you have to, when you have, they're, they're, they're not learning anything here. They're just making operations on the tensors during the, the flow of the network. Um, lambda layer, you, with the lambda layer, you can actually specify the, um, a custom Python function to apply to the tensor. All right. Please keep in mind that what an, a, a, a Keras layer gets an input is always a, a tensor object, which is going to be physically and concretely cor corresponding to a, a TensorFlow tensor object or a Theano tensor object, or in this case, uh, nowadays also we have a CNTK tensor object, right? So uh, to give you just the idea, 
Uh, when you run the, the fit and the training process using Keras, Keras indeed is not performing any real operation on the GPU. All right. So the Keras code relies on the Python level, and all the real computation on the GPU and stuff is demanded completely to the back end. The main advantage you get from this approach is that the same code you write, the, exactly the same code, is uh, supposed and guaranteed to work on all the backends supported by Keras without changing any single line of code. <coughs> Keras does all the job for you, even if there are some very slight and uh, tiny differences uh, between the, for instance, the handling of the shapes of tensors between te Tiano and TensorFlow. Keras does all the job for you. You don't have to change anything. That's, that, that's the power of Keras, indeed. Uh, another important layer is the activation regularization, so you can actually apply uh, regularizers on the ac activation functions to, uh, so for instance, L1 or L2 regularization uh, on the activation functions of your network. Uh, this picture, um, uh, kindly provided by uh, my friend Ian, uh, shows all the, probably it's a bit tiny, but uh, should give you a, a, an overview of all the things, all the kind of networks supported by Keras. Uh, Keras provides support for feedforward network, so the classical network, you, you, you provide input on the left and you get output on the right, so the feedforward network in these sets of networks, also the convolution networks uh, uh, fill in. Uh, you have recurrent neural network, of course, support for LSTM or uh, gated recurrent unit network, and also for unsupervised learning, you, you can actually build autoencoders, variational autoencoders, uh, and uh, sequence sequence networks using uh, using Keras code. Uh, and finally, Keras also provides uh, support for different optimizers, not just the stochastic gradient descent, of course. There are many of them. You can have. Ada grad, Ada delta, LMS prop, lots of different optimizer. Uh, you can actually take a look at the Keras.optimizers package to see all of them, uh, all of those optimizers supported by Keras. So if you want to data sciencing a bit this example, okay, so we're going to play a bit with the hyperparameter of the network and the uh, parameter of the fit method. All right, so I assume you all know what overfitting is or underfitting is, so uh, something we can do, all right? So uh, the, the one method I'm going to show you, because we're going to use it very, uh, very heavily, a lot, uh, is this summary method for the model object. When you call the summary, you actually have a look on what are the layers, what are the output shape, how many parameters you have, and in the end, how many total parameters you have, and how many of them are trainable parameters. Uh, if this does not make any sense to you, it will make uh, very soon. Uh, but so far, the number of parameters and total number of trainable parameters are going to be the same. Um, all right. So, that science thing about this example, we're going to, of course, use some sort of train test split on the data. So, we have not only training data, but also validation data we want to fed into the training process. Uh, we're going to apply uh, a technique which is called early stopping. So the early stopping technique is something that uh, is typically used when you have big networks and lots of data. Uh, the intuition is that when you, in this case, we're going to monitor this metric which is called the validation loss. So when the validation loss does not change after two epochs and does not change significantly, so you can actually specify the precision you want, the training process is automatically stopped. All right. So this is the early stop, early stopping, because differently from other machine learning methods, uh, unless you specify these kind of tricks, when you run a fit of a neural network, you have to specify for how many steps you want the learning to go on. Right. So the number of epochs, so called. Uh, and uh, this other object is the model checkpoint. During each epoch, at each step automatically this function, this object, uh, records uh, uh, the, the, the value of the validation loss again and 
saves the weights, so the status of the network at that stage, and uh, automatically this has been uh, set up to save only the best model. So in the end you get the best weight configuration, so leading to the best validation loss uh, value. Um, you can plug both of them using this parameter in the fit method here, which is the callbacks. So Keras provides uh, this way to plug additional callback objects. They're called callbacks because they're automatically called by the framework before the next batch or before the next epoch is going to be processed during the training. You don't have to do anything. You just pass the callbacks. Uh, you specify a different, num we're going to specify a different number of epochs. We're going to specify what are the validation data in this case. We previously provided just training data. And these are the two mandatory parameters, the very first two. Validation data again, and we specify the, the size of the batch. And we also specify that we want some verbosity, but this is the default one. All right. All right, so we run it for 50 epochs, and this goes on and on. Uh, additionally, um, we also have a validation loss that, in, since we have validation data in this case, we're going to also have the computation of the validation loss. So during each step, we have a, 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 a log of how the loss changes, the training loss changes, and the validation loss changes. Okay, moving on. Okay, very, very briefly, uh, moving on just a bit. So we want to create a multi-layer fully connected network. When we say fully connected network, we're going to expect to have all dense layers. Uh, the, the, the very first example of a multi-layer multi fully connected network is the multi-layer perceptron. Uh, the multi-layer perceptron is characterized by having one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer. All right. So technically, uh, when you have this sort of uh, network, so one j with just one hidden layer in the middle, you're calling it multi-layer perceptron. When you have at least more than one hidden layer, you're allowed to call it deep network. All right. So when you have at least two layers in the middle, it's going to be a deep network. Uh, so in this case, we're going to have a multi-layer perceptron because we have one input layer. And this is just the decision layer, so it's going to be a very shallow network yet. Um, and as you may assume, the way you plug additional layer, so you build a multi-layer network in Keras, is just by calling the add method to the sequential object multiple times with different layers. All right. So again, make, uh, make sure that you specify the input shape in the very first layer, in the second layer, don't have to because it's automatically induced by the previous layer. All right. So again, we compile the model. We sum we we print the summary. So we have dense number two, dense number three here, and the final activation, which is the softmax for the decision function. Of course, since we have 100 neurons here in output uh, and nine in the end, the total number of parameters has increased, as you may accept, I expect. Uh, then we run the fit model again, and um, uh, the validation loss changes drastically considering the same data. Uh, yes. So this is 1.6 taken just randomly, and this is 0 0.7. So this is going to be a better model with respect to the previous one with our data. So if you want to play a bit, uh, there's an exercise for you. Uh, the idea is to play a bit with it, adding as much layers as you want. Better to add a uh, couple of, uh, and run it in your machine to, to, to be sure that everything's uh, up and running, and to see that it's very easy to, to run uh, using Keras. All right. The next steps will be taking a brief look uh, what is called the Keras backend. <coughs> I just want to show you the Keras backend uh, because this is how actually Keras allows you to have multiple backends uh, running um, for, your, for your deep learning code. Okay. 
So the uh, to give you some hints, uh, the only the, the the way to play with it is just to add additional dance layer. Uh, how many neurons you want to add? How many layers you want to add? Nobody knows. You just play with it and you see what what if that makes any difference to the final results. That's the the, the takeaway typically from for deep learning. At the end of the day, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so uh, let's have a look at this uh, Keras backend. Um, the Keras backend is the module uh, which is provided by Keras um, that integrates to, to real backends. Uh, if you take a look at this uh, dot backend package, Right in Keras, so uh, it's going to be the the, the Keras dot backend package. Uh, if you take a look at the code, you will see that in, in that package, Python package, you will find uh, a file which is called a module, Python module, which is called TensorFlow underscore backend dot py, Theano underscore backend dot py, and C now CNTK underscore backend dot py. So this backend is a sort of wrapper module that calls the, the real backend uh, depending on the configuration file or the environment variable you have set up in your settings before running your code. All right. So we have actually uh, set up our TensorFlow backend in the configuration file, as you may have assumed. So I will just want to show you. So if I'm going to cat the keras.json file, all right. Among these configurations, we have the backend, and we are specifying TensorFlow. If we just switch this directive to Theano, you're done. You just rerun your code, all right, and Keras automatically switches everything on Theano backend, all right. Uh, how this backend works? So, uh, as I said, the keras.backend is the wrapper for the other module. All these modules, so basically the keras backend provides the, the interface. And all the, the functions provided in this keras backend module are assumed to have a counterpart in each of the backends supported. So when you're actually calling the, uh, okay, let's have a look at it. So maybe it's easier to, to do. So uh, we are actually re using the Keras backend API to reimplement again the logistic regression example, but in, in this case, we actually we're still using Keras code. All right. So let's have a look. So here we are creating placeholder objects using the K module, which is the Keras backend. We just call it K. It's just a sort of naming convention here. All right. So the K is going to be the Keras backend module, and we're going to create a placeholder object. The syntax is very TensorFlow-ish, all right? It's very similar to TensorFlow. But what actually happens in the backend is not uh, TensorFlow uh, always, depending on the, it, it really depends on the backend you're using. So if I'm using TensorFlow as a backend, this instruction is going to create a TensorFlow placeholder object. If I'm going to, to use Theano, that is going to be uh, a creation of Theano tensor object, all right? This is the, the, the backend API. So we, we are creating a variable object again. So the, the level of, us, of abstraction has changed drastically, has moved again to the same level of, of abstraction you have using TensorFlow or Theano, or Theano packages, but with a big difference that the, this code is supposed to run at, um, seem, seemingly uh, using all the backends you want, those supported, of course. So without changing any single line of code just the configuration file, all right? So this is going to create a TensorFlow tensor, if you're using TensorFlow, yes. All right. Okay, so I repeat the question. So the question uh, was, why would you actually have support for multiple backends, right? Uh, because of many reasons, need. Um, you can, uh, because the different backends have different performances, all right? And so you, you want to leverage on the benefits of those uh, switching the backends. 
uh, because some times ago, um, the memory management of TensorFlow was ru re really rubbish. So you typically wanted to switch to Theano to have a better allocation memory. Now it's not the case, all right? Um, because um, sometimes uh, you want to try different backends having uh, to test if everything is working with the same performances, all right? Because of numerical reasons, because of numerical optimization, you may get, you may get all right? For instance, uh, I just read uh, a sort of benchmark article uh, providing a sort of uh, overview of the, of the um, um, benefits uh, provided by CNTK. CNTK, among those backends, is the only one using MPI in the backend. So multiple um, messaging, um, passing, message passing interface, right? <laughs> so for multiple processing. Uh, uh, as far as I know, CNTK is built uh, on top of MPI. Uh, so far now, TensorFlow supports MPI in the version 1.3, so the latest one. Um, and considering the different network architectures, at the end of the day, CNTK has turned to be the most efficient using uh, for the recurrent neural networks, which are going to, to be the very heavy network to train, the one that takes more time, that take more time to train. All right. So, for instance, for convolutional networks, TensorFlow and CNTK are sort of the same performances, according to that benchmark. But CNTK uh, won for on recurrent neural network, for instance. So maybe you want to switch to CNTK using uh, without changing any single line of code, that, that's a benefit. And you don't have to, to, to mess with the very tiny details of the different implementations, because, because Keras does it for you. All the three backends have totally different APIs and totally different uh, syntax <coughs> for creating tensors. Keras does the job for you to translate all of them. And the way it does is using this Keras backend. So when you're actually running, that's it. This is what I was looking for. When I actually run this function, the k dot function, this is calling matbool for TensorFlow and the dot function on Theano. All right? I don't know the equivalent in CNTK, but uh, TensorFlow decided to call the dot product mat mat matbool, matrix multiplication, for some reason. Okay? Uh, when you call k dot dot, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's going to, to, to be mapped to the corresponding function in the corresponding backend automatically. That's it. Uh, using the, 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 so now the question could be, why would you do that? Why would you implement it uh, using the Keras backend? So what's the reason why uh, Keras provides you these API to be used? Because this is the same API you're actually using when you're creating custom layers. If you create custom layers using the Keras backend API, you're automatically sure that that implementation is going to work on all the backends provided. Because you're, you're using the Keras backend functions. You're not using the TensorFlow or the Theano real functions. All right? You see what I mean? OK. So the rest of this notebook is to show you how you, you, you basically do the same TensorFlow-ish stuff using the K backend, and there's also a, a, an exercise for you, which I'm going to skip, which is the implementation of the linear regression. I'm going to skip also because you indeed have the solutions in your, uh, in your material, so if you load it, you're done. All right? Okay, so in case you don't have any questions, I would just move forward. Yes, please. Um, yes, uh, you, you, you're actually stuck. Uh, sorry, uh, I repeat the question. Uh, I'm actually uh, advertising all the benefits of Keras, and so the question was, uh, what's the downside of it? Um, I may say that the downside of Keras uh, stands on the downside of the supported frameworks, supported backends. Um, I would say two things. Not all the functions are really supported by Keras backend because Keras backends, uh, since it has to provide you that 
the same code works seem seemingly on all, all the backends. In case there are some very specific functions supported by one specific backend, you're not going to find it in the in the Keras backend API. Uh, but uh, a sort of uh, uh, note about this is that if this framework, the one that has this tiny function, is going to be TensorFlow, you can actually manage to do it because Keras is going to be uh, integrated in TensorFlow, and it, it is better integrated uh, each uh, version by each version. Um, I will show you something in the end. Um, that's one prob problem you have. Uh, and um, the downside, another downside I may say is that uh, since Keras is not doing any real computation, uh, you, you can do with Keras everything you can do with all the frameworks. All right? But if you, if, if for instance, uh, so far in TensorFlow, uh, which is the one I, I, I know the best uh, among the three, uh, th there's no official support for dynamic graph computation. So everything is going to be static. All right? So uh, this means that when you, when you create the graph, you have to compile the model indeed. So this means that after you create in the network, you're compiling it. So you're creating the network beforehand, you compile it, and so the graph, the, the resulting graph, will be put, uh, all the tensors will be put into the memory of the GPU, typically, if you have it. Uh, and so that graph, it, it, it is very difficult to change it during the training. You cannot do that, all right? Uh, the PyTorch approach that I believe we will see in the keynote we have on, in two days, uh, you will see that that approach is totally different. That's called dynamic <coughs> graph creation. So you create it one step at a time during the execution. And so that's a, a sort of different approach to that. Keras does not do that because PyTorch is not supported yet. I say yet. I don't know if we'll be supported at some time. All right? Yes. Default backend? Yes. So the default backend was the question. And the answer is Theano is the default one. Uh, you can actually go to the configuration file. Or, so as I showed you, you just, for instance, let me, let me do this. All right. I can show you in a terminal. Maybe it's better. I don't want to, to risk to waste the notebooks. But uh, uh, indeed, if you uh, you have two two ways. All right. So um, so if I if I if I print I cut Keras dot JSON file, you will see that the back end is TensorFlow because I set it. Um, if I the if I do change this um, directive, all right. If I specify Theano here, or even CNTK, all right. Now the backend is Theano. If I actually go in Python and import Keras, this is using Theano backend. You see? Um, if I do this just to play a bit, CNTK should be installed. Ah, this gives me the opportunity to say a few words about that. Using CNTK backend. Um, I, I, I did not include that examples using CNTK, uh, and mainly for one reason, because CNTK is still only supported on Windows machines and Linux machines. There's no support for Mac OS. You can actually have CNTK installed using a Docker image. So I prefer not to, in, to include all, also these into s the setup of this <coughs> environment. It was not really required. The main focus was uh, on Keras, of course, but 
this is was the main reason. And the reason why is it, I don't really know. It's Microsoft stuff. You know, in the end, it's always Microsoft. So let me switch back to TensorFlow. Another way you can do it is by setting us a Keras underscore. Let me just move a bit so you can reduce it. Right. So you can actually ex export. Uh, no, let me do this. Yes, I can do it. Uh, Keras underscore backend environment variable backend equals to Tiano. Okay, let me show this first. If I do this, oh, sorry. If I import Keras, now it should be TensorFlow again. <coughs> All right, it takes some time, typically. Okay, if I do, oh, I can do this. Keras underscore backend equal Tiano, Python minus M import Keras. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, is it how's the way to do it? I can remember. Minus A, C. Thank you so much. Using the other backend, so you can actually define this Keras backend environment variable, and you switch the backend without changing the configuration file. Uh, this is because the configuration file is just one file. So if you want to have multiple Keras uh, instances running. Uh, it's not a good idea to change the configuration files multiple times. So you just define the, the environment variable there, uh, the carriers underscore backend, and you're done. All right? Okay. Are there any other questions? Fine. So let's move on. And let's talk about uh, this uh, MNIST dataset. I, I believe all of you already know what the MNIST dataset is about. Uh, in scikit-learn word, uh, this is also known as the digits dataset. So the MNIST dataset is one of the widely, widely used dataset for uh, deep learning uh, experiments. And um, at some point, they decided that it was uh, fair enough <laughs> to not use it anymore. Uh, but the MNIST database contains images, black and white images, of handwritten digits. Uh, and so you want to uh, a network, in our case, to, um, uh, to be able to identify the, the corresponding digits, uh, taking a look at the, um, at the image. All right. Uh, so this notebook is just to show you that Keras uh, just like as uh, scikit-learn uh, ships with with these datasets um, dataset module uh, in these datasets uh, MNIST database uh, is provided so you can actually import from keras.datasets MNIST module and with the load data uh, this method downloads the data for you in case you don't have it uh, and the downloaded data will be placed in your .keras, home, uh, .keras folder and you can actually get the data by loading it automatically. Uh, the rest of the notebook is just to, for you to play a bit. Um, so I was asking what type of X-train is and the reason is, um, the, the, the answer is, of course, it's an ampere array. So once we have loaded, if we type the type of X-train, it's going to be NumPy and array. All right. Uh, the type of uh, Y train is going to be an ND array again. So uh, the load data automatically gives you back the data into NumPy arrays, which is something you typically want to, to have um, when you have to experiment. Uh, how many observation and training data we have? So again, it's going to be the x train dot shape of zero, of course. So the number of samples we're going to have 
uh, 60,000 samples in the training set and 10,000, I will tell you, in the, the test set. All right. Uh, how many num what's the number of observation for each digits? Uh, so it's going to be trained out shape again, but I will tell you that's 60,000, of course. Uh, blah, blah. So the dimension of X-train, so if you take a look at the X-train dot shape, we're going to have 60,000 of 28 times 28 images. All right, so we're going to have images of that size. Uh, since we're dealing, see, since the MNIST uh, images are black and white images, you don't have the channel information. So it's black and white, so it's just two-dimensional object, no, not three-dimensional object, all right? Uh, so very, very quickly, if you want to take a look at these images, you just have to, you can actually print it, all right? So I'm going to, to print the X-train of zero here. And this is going to be a sort of handwritten five. Okay, so we're going to use this data set to play with um, the, the, the rest of the two notebooks. Okay, the first notebook is, uh, again, about fully connected fee forward network. Uh, the, 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 let's say the more complicated feed forward network, fully connect, uh, feed forward network, we're going to to take a look at uh, are going to be the uh, convolutional network. Uh, some uh, um, recall of the main uh, things we already uh, did. So sequential object and the graph model of, of the object. Uh, we talked about the dense layer, AKA fully connected layer. Uh, in this notebook, we're going to introduce a new, a new layer, which is called the dropout layer. Uh, and uh, we applied a binary cross-entropy or a categorical cross-entropy uh, to our data using the stochastic grid descent optimizer. Uh, here you have the links to have a look at what Keras supports as optimizers and loss functions. Uh, we now introduce uh, this new activation function, which is called the ReLU function, so the re rectified linear unit. Uh, this function is going to be very useful um, in a uh, convolutional network. Uh, this function has lots of mathematical properties uh, and this is the definition, the mathematical definition of the function. So this activation is going to return the maximum value between zero and x. So this means that all the negative values, all the negative activations will be automatically dropped out. Uh, when you ca calculate the derivative of this function has a sort of uh, sigmoid, uh, uh, recalls the, the uh, sigmoid logistic function. Uh, so the, the derivative of this function is called the soft plus function. And uh, this function, despite its simplicity, is one of the coolest things invented in the deep network words many uh, years ago. Uh, so the note, keep in mind this function as it's heavily used in convolutional neural network. So the, the exercise now asks you to uh, build this network uh, this sort of syntax is quite standard uh, when you have to specify the uh, architecture of the network. So in this case, we're going to have a fully connected network, fully connected layer with 512 uh, neurons in output plus the ReLU function activation. Again, the same configuration. And finally, another fully connected layer, FC, with a total of number of clusters neurons plus the softmax activation function. So if you don't want to bother too much about it, you just load it and that's it. So you have, uh, you create the sequential object and you just plug all these layers using the add model again. It's very simple and straightforward, as you can see. So you have dense 522 activation ReLU and input shape because it's the first layer has 784. Uh, uh, can, can you guess why this number is the input shape? It's 28 times 28. So we're going to linearize the images and provide it as just one big tensor or vector. All right? Um, this is because dense networks are not supposed to, uh, typically are not supposed to handle uh, multidimensional arrays, but you can, you can actually do it. Um, Again, dense layer as requested with the activation ReLU and uh, the last 10 layers, so the number of classes with the softmax activation. Uh, 
we specify the categorical cross entropy again and the SGD optimizer. Uh, please note that this time, differently from, from previous examples, uh, when we provided the optimizer parameter, we provided an actual Python object, normal strings. To be honest, the code is exactly the same, because when we provide SGD object here without any additional parameter, we're actually setting a new object with the default parameter values, which is exactly the same we get when we provide the string SGD. All right? But this is was just to show you that you can plug not only strings, but, all, but real objects. Okay? Uh, if you're curious enough to understand how these uh, string parameters are indeed implemented in Keras, take a look at the code, and uh, I will tell you it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's a matter of globals in the namespace. So uh, you will find uh, in, the, uh, in the loss package an object which is called exactly in this way, categorical underscore cross entropy. And so when you provide parameters using strings, Keras looks for that string in the global namespace, and so returns the object. That's the trick. All right? Uh, and so this is the case for ReLU, this is the case for Softmax, and blah, blah, blah. Okay? So you can indeed provide real Python object, a real Python function, or strings if it comes to uh, handy. And moreover, we're also adding this additional uh, parameter to the compile method, which is the metrics. So in this case, we're going to record the accuracy during the learning phase. Uh, so Keras, um, uh, so Keras actually, this is actually repeated. So Keras, what, when you run it, so Keras automatically stores the um, <coughs> the the accuracy. No, I was looking that. All right. So so we created the model here. Let let me just run it. Yes. So we create the model here. We get the data, the MNIST data. Of course, the shape is the one we had previously. So we have to do a little bit of reshape because the input shape of our network is going to be 788. So we're going to reshape the NumPy arrays. This is pure NumPy operations. All right. And finally, we're going to apply this two, two categorical function provided by Keras to utils to translate the labels in one hot encoding. And this is because, maybe you, you didn't get it, but we, ha we want to have the one hot encoding for the labels because the last layer has 10 neurons in output. All right? So since the last layer is the one that will be used to, be com to calculate the error function okay, on the labels you have, the labels must have 10 dimensions. All right, that's why you want to apply one hot encoding. You see what I mean? It's fine? All right. Okay, so we did it. We just train and test split. So we have this one. This is just one images. Of course, this was different because it's been randomly splitted. Uh, as we see, we have this one hot encoding. So for for this X train, the label of Y train of zero is going to be nine. <coughs> so all zero apart from the last one. Uh, we take another one from the validation set. This is one, and this is the label. Of course, it's one, as we expected. Okay, now we train the model here. We just run it for two epochs. We don't, do not expect very big results, but just to make it running. And just to, this is how actually it's working. Uh, okay, so we have this loss, we have this, uh, and take a look here. We also have the accuracy for training data and for validation data because we recorded that metric in the compile method. All right, so we have loss accuracy, validation loss, and validation accuracy. Um, something which is new now uh, for you, maybe is that we recorded the output of the fit method, and we call it network history. Uh, that's because by default, 
recalling you the callbacks of Keras, by default, the model.fit method returns you an history callback object. This callback object embeds all the, the history of the training process for you to take a look after that. So, uh, if we want to plot the network performance trend, we have this network history object, and we're going to, as you, take it, as you, as you can see, the network history object at this attribute, which is called history, which is going to be a, a dictionary having keys for all the, for the uh, with uh, names corresponding to those returned uh, during, uh, during the learning phase. So we're going to have a loss and a val loss. We're going to have an accuracy, ACC, and a validation accuracy here. And so the, our uh, intention here is to plot the differences of training and validation accuracies and the, the training and validation loss and the training and validation accuracy. Of course, these are going to be just two epochs, as you can see, so zero and one, zero and one again. So this is not very meaningful, but it's just to show you how you can do it. Uh, after two epochs, we get just more or less 88% of validation accuracy, but if you increase the number of epochs, you will get definitely better results. Um, so uh, in this case, we've uh, added a new a parameter for the stochastic gradient descent, and we fit again the model here. And let me skip it, it's not very important. Okay, let me introduce another important uh, um, layer, which is the dropout layer. The dropout layer is a very simple one. The idea of the dropout layer is to be used during the training phase to avoid overfitting. The idea is that when you put a dropout layer in the middle of your network, uh, you specify a drop rate, uh, all right? And so by that drop rate, some connections from the previous layer to the next layer, neurons, will be dropped randomly, all right? So that's the idea of the dropout layer, no more than that. Um, something you may keep in mind, that the, 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 the Keras API expects you pr to provide the dropout layer. Some frameworks expect you to provide the, rate, the retain probability, not the dropping probability, all right? Keras wants the dropping rate. So for instance, if you specify uh, a, um, a dropout layer of 0 0.2, this means that you have 20% of probability to drop the connection, all right? So dropping the connection means that you basically put a zero for that neuron from the previous layer to the next one. All right? Uh, the intuition is that when you, you do it randomly, uh, only during the learning phase, important, only during the learning phase, of course, uh, you're, you're doing it because you want to have some variability in your data. All right? So you're randomly uh, dropping, muting some con connections between neurons to, to, um, to have uh, variability in your data, to, to avoid overfitting. Um, just, to, just to show you this, uh, if you import the dropout layer from the Keras layer, and you take a look at, at the code of the dropout, as I told you, the, the Keras code is Python code, so you, you can actually take a look at it. Let me see if I can uh, make it bigger. No, this is not. Uh, where is it? I made a mess, as expected. Sorry. Uh, where is it? Is this one? No. Too many things opened. That's why I do too much stuff. All uh, right. I made a mess. I'm sorry about that. I had good intentions, I promise. Uh, let me go back to it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, but that's because, right. Okay, so if you take a look at it, all right, this is the implementation of the dropout class in Keras code. When you see it during the call method, 
All right. This is the interesting part. So it returns it, these, the returning of this k dot in train phase function. So if you take a look at it, of these k dot in train phase, all right, the meaning of this function is to select x if the network is actually in the training phase, is to select alt otherwise, so in, it's an in inference phase. So again, back to the dropout, this means that if the network uh, if the network is, is during the training phase, this layer returns the dropped inputs. Otherwise, it returns the inputs as it is. So you don't have to worry about the fact that the dropout is only applied during the learning phase. Because it must be only applied, of course, during the, only during the learning phase, because it's supposed to avoid overfitting. All right? <coughs> This is some internals I want to show you. So apart from this, these exercises just ask you to, to change a bit the code. You actually have it down there. Um, to change the previous configuration using the dropout layer. And again, see the difference in performances. And these are the difference. So they, this uh, starts to have more sense on the data you have especially, but with the fact that now the accuracy reaches the 90%, even if you have th uh, only three epochs. Uh, of course, if you continue training at some point, you will start overfitting, and so we can try plugging some early stopping into the network to, help to, to skip it. Uh, moving on something more interesting, uh, something you can actually do with the uh, Keras layers, sequential object. Uh, I don't know, uh, how much time do you have? Half an hour? Five minutes? <laughs> Kidding, right? <laughs> it's not five minutes, it's, it's six minutes. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I usually have lots of stuff to say. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, um, uh, okay, le let me just say this. Uh, something you, you can do in the uh, using the Keras object is to take a look at it, and it's very handy to see uh, what are the especially when you have a big network, uh, what are the layers uh, in it. Um, so you can actually iterate the using the layers attribute. Uh, inside the model, so you can take a look at it and take a look at the different parameters of the layers. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of them, even with this quite shallow network. Uh, something very interesting is to extract the hidden layer representation of the given network. Uh, this means that uh, sometimes it is very useful to see how the network is actually interpreting and seeing the data inside the network. So it's just a way to open the black box of the deep learning. Um, there are many, many ways to do, to do it. Uh, one simple and most intuitive way is to uh, create a network, uh, train the network, all right? Create another similar network and it, that network is going to be exactly the same network up to the last layer you want to take a look at. All right? So imagine that we want to see how the data changes after the, the first dropout. All right? So remember, we have a dense dropout, dense dropout, another dense. Okay? So we had model already pre-trained. After the training, we have a set of weights. So we want to, to see what's the internal presentation of this layer. So one straightforward way to do it is to uh, create a truncated version of this network, initialize the weights for these layers by taking a look, by setting uh, each layer's weights to the same weights of the target model, all right? We compile the truncated model, and then we just run it in inference mode. All right, so we call it predict, not fit in this case. Okay, this is one way to do it. 
this is, of course, the uh, Python way to do it. So you're actually dealing with Python objects here. Another uh, less intuitive, but uh, definitely a more effective way to do it is to uh, leverage on the underground graph of tensors you have. And so letting TensorFlow or the backend you're using to do the actual job. So you can actually manage to implement this function. Okay, there's this implementation at, at the very end okay, of the network, of the notebook. So you implement it, this function, which is called get activation. You pass it the model, all right? Uh, so the target model you want, the target layer, and the actual data you want to, to take a look at. Uh, and we are actually using the K function here. So we are creating a function that has the, the input tensor of the first layer as input and the target layer tensor as the output layer. Sorry, as the output tensor. The, the, this K function is dealing with tensors. All right, so we're passing the, the tensor of the input layer as input to this function, and the output of this function will be recorded to the output tensor of the target layer. Okay, so we call this function on the data, and that's it. And so, since these tensors are automatically connected inside the network, when you call the activation function, you pass the data to the, through these tensors, all these tensors are connected. So they're actually calculating the activations of each tensors up to the target layer we want. This is less intuitive, I know, but this is definitely more effective because we're actually dealing with uh, TensorFlow or Theano in the very, in the very end. Why would you do that? Because you want to take a look at how the network see the data during the or after the learning phase. And typically, you end up in, do, in doing something like this. So imagine that we have already processed it. Uh, you don't have to imagine because it, it, it is what you're seeing. Uh, already processed the um, MNIST data. <coughs> Sorry. We want to get the that internal representation of features, so 512 features from the 784 we had initially, and we wanted to plot this data in two dimensions, so we applied some manifold learning on it. We, we call it the TSNE in this piece of code, so we are actually calling it the TSNE from scikit-learn, and so we're transforming our data using these hidden features. In particular, we are just getting the first thousand samples, not all of them. And after that, we want to take a look at how these data are scrambled in the space and with each color corresponding to the different classes we have. Maybe we, we can see it interac in, inter interactively, sorry, using the, the Boki uh, library. All right, so let me reduce a bit the dimension so you can see the labels. No, maybe not. All right. So uh, this is quite expected in some way because, uh, for instance, zeros are all here. Here you have, I think, all the sevens, but inside them you still have some nines, which could make sense, okay? We are dealing with handwritten digits, so maybe some nines may be written on some seven, maybe. Uh, there's a lot of mess here, and these are the most difficult classes for the network. Um, the black ones are the six, and the six may be messed with the with the five, some not really. Maybe with this ones with the four. Well, well, this is maybe strange. Um, uh, there's a, some mess here, so you, you have the tree with some two. But yeah, this is just to take a look at what's happening inside the network, all right? This is quite handy and useful to do. And this is typically something you want to do when you want to take a look inside and what's happening during the learning or what happened during the learning after the, the training phase. So uh, 
uh, unfortunately, there's lots of stuff I want to show you, but we don't have the time to do that. Uh, if you have time and you, you, you want to, uh, take a look at the materials. Uh, everything is uh, on GitHub. Um, please give me feedback if you have it. Uh, PR if you have it. Uh, if you spot some errors, of course, there will be. I will definitely uh, be more than happy to do that. Um, so I'm going to conclude in case you, uh, you have questions. Yes, please. Yep. Uh, okay, so the question was uh, how the, the, the last method to visualize the, the hidden representation, uh, have, how that method works with non-sequential networks. Uh, how, what do you mean by no sequential networks? Yeah. Yeah. So ba basically, uh, you you cannot have no con not connected graphs in uh, in uh, in carriers. Uh, otherwise, you end up with errors. Uh, uh, and that's particularly interesting because if you take a look at the implementation and how uh, Keras uh, detects unconnected graphs, it's bottom-up approach. So it starts from the last layer and goes up to the input layer, and it traverses the the, the graphs. All the tensors it founds uh, it finds during the path, they are all connected to the same graphs. So at the end of the day, you always have connected tensors. You cannot have unconnected ones. Uh, and so the sequential object. The sequential object is just a Python wrapper object. At the end of the day, you always have tensor objects connected one after the other. Uh, you, 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 can indeed have, uh, you can indeed have tensors connected to multiple other tensors. You can have it. You can have multiple, and this is the content of this uh, notebook, the number 10, the multimodal network, you can, sorry, it's very tiny, multimodal networks, with the multimodal networks, you can actually have multiple input network, so ex accept network accepting more than one input tensor, and multiple output network, so network having a multi-objective problem, so multiple losses to optimize during the training. And but at the end, you always have a connected graph, so you can always reach the target tensor you're interested in from one other tensor. There's no way some tensor is not connected to any other, I think. Yep. <coughs> yes, but you can... Yeah. So you said uh, uh, network topologies may be much more complicated than the one we, uh, we worked on, but there should always be a way to reach tensor inside the graph. Otherwise, it's not unconnected. So you can always do that. Yes, please. So in, uh, the question was about recurrent neural network and how you structure the data. So uh, the difference with recurrent neural network is that you provide data in sequence, and so that layer expects you to provide a sequence of tensors in input, and you specify the length of the sequence. You may specify the length of the input sequence and the length of the output sequence. So what's the number of sequences you want to take into account in input, and what's the, the dimension of the output prediction? How many objects you want to, how many tensors you want to output? That's the difference. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was. In my example of the MNIST, the validation accuracy was better than the training accuracy. It shouldn't be the way around. The reason is we actually trained that network for two or three epochs, so it, it was very 
few number of epochs to train. So it's totally meaningless. It's just to show that you can, what you can do in, in Keras. It's not uh, real performances, of course, but of course, thanks for pointing out. But it's totally meaningless. Don't, don't rely on it. It's just playground. Any other question? Okay, so again, thank you very, very much for being here. Uh, please let me know if, there's, if you have questions or uh, inquiries about the materials. Uh, and enjoy with it. <laughs>